Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the video that I have for today is one that I feel like will stir up some mixed emotions and I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody thinks about it at the end of the video. But before we get into the case, I just wanted to take a second to give a huge shout out to my patrons, Jade, James, Robin, Stephanie, and Angel. Thank you all so much for being members of the Patreon family. I am so, so grateful for your support. I cannot even begin to express how how much your support means to me. Again, thank you all so, so very much for everything that you do to support me and helping me keep this channel going. Okay, so with that, let's get into the video. So the video for today is a solved one, but it is a little bit controversial and there's a lot of people out there who think that this person was wrongly convicted and that it truly does involve an act of self-defense. So with that, let's just get right into it. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of Alex Woodworth and Ezra McCandless. Ezra McCandless was born on October 6th, 1998 in Stanley, Wisconsin to Rosalina Gunnelston, and she was actually originally named Monica. Now, Ezra's mother was only 14 years old when she gave birth to her and her father was not in the picture. She really didn't have any contact with him at all. By the time she was four years old, she was legally adopted by Rosalina's partner at the time, Josh Carlin. The two were married at some point, but the two who divorced by the time Ezra was 12 years old. But even after that, she did maintain a close relationship with her adoptive father. Once she reached high school, Ezra, still named Monica, sort of struggled with her identity. She felt like she didn't really identify with the name that she was given, and she played around with the idea of maybe changing her pronouns. This is also when she made the decision to legally change her name from Monica Carlin to Ezra McCandless. She said that the first name Ezra just fit better with her, and she picked the last name McCandless after Chris McCandless, the free-spirited man whose life was described in the book and movie Into the Wild. After high school, she went on to college, but she dropped out and ended up moving to Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Eau Claire is described as a little big town where everyone knows everyone. It's a free-spirited town to live in, and Ezra was fully able to express herself. Ezra was an artist who loved being at the center of attention, and she drew her designs all over her car so that she could show off her art to everybody. Now, in the summer of 2017, 19-year-old Ezra met a 34-year-old National Guard medic named Jason Mangle. The two started dating very quickly, and by August of that same year, in 2017, the two moved into an apartment together. According to Jason, he was in love with Ezra the moment they met and they knew that they could make a relationship work despite the large age gap. He said that she was very spur of the moment and energetic and just kept him moving. Ezra described the relationship as an ancient love so powerful that it scared them both. One place that the couple frequented was Racy's Coffee Shop, which was a very popular spot for young people to hang out in downtown. While there, the two met and befriended Alex Woodworth, a 23-year-old barista who worked there. Alex Woodworth also worked as a substitute teacher in his spare time. He was a graduate from UW-Eau Claire and had a bachelor's degree in philosophy with a minor in biology, and he was starting to apply to graduate school with the hopes of earning a PhD in philosophy and hoped to one day become a philosophy professor. Alex was described as a nice guy who was also quite a nerd. He was a deep thinker and he was absolutely devoted to philosophy. He spent hours upon hours reading books and writing about philosophy. He was also described as a family guy. Alex was the oldest of four siblings and he loved taking care of his younger brothers and sisters. He was super Super lovey dovey and had a knack for taking care of things that nobody else wanted to take care of. He loved protecting bugs and spiders simply because he knew other people didn't like them and he was no different with his newfound friend, Ezra. At the time that Ezra met Alex, she was going through some really emotionally difficult things. In October of 2017, Ezra actually found out that she was pregnant with Jason's child. She knew that she was not ready for a child though, so she drove to Minneapolis to get an abortion. Naturally, this is a really difficult thing to go through and not a lot of people understand the trauma that this causes, so she felt really really guilty for this and she felt completely isolated. According to Jason, her emotional problems did take a toll on the relationship, but he knew just how good 
Alex was at helping people who are going through some difficult times. So he sort of pushed Ezra to get close with Alex because she needed a friend who understood her and could help her. However, Ezra and Alex did end up becoming more than friends. Soon after her abortion, her and Alex began a secret relationship behind Jason's back. Then, around the same time, Jason had gone off for two weeks for work with the National Guard. While he was gone, Ezra started another sexual relationship with another man named John Hansen, who was also a friend of Jason's. Now, apparently, after Jason had gotten back from being with the National Guard, one night after Ezra had fallen asleep, Jason had looked through her phone and read all of her text messages and saw evidence of both of these relationships. Of course, Jason had confronted both Alex and John about these relationships. He basically went to Alex and was like, how could you do this? I thought we were friends. And then he called up John and yelled at him too. Eventually though, Ezra had told Jason that this relationship between her and John was not consensual and that John had actually sexually assaulted her. She said that the two had been drinking together one night when she blacked out and he sexually assaulted her while she was passed out. Of course, Jason freaked out and immediately went to police to file a police report. Police interviewed Ezra, of course, and she told them pretty much the same thing that she told Jason that the two had been drinking and she blacked out and that is when all of this happened. However, as police started to look into this and started reading through all of her text messages, turns out Ezra had actually confided in Alex and told him that the sexual encounter was consensual, but she had just regretted it. So of course, this entire case was dropped. So after this, the relationships with both Alex and Jason ended. I have seen some sources that says that Ezra had ended it with both of them. I've seen some that say that Jason ended it with her and then she ended it with Alex. It's also been reported that she claimed that Jason actually took advantage of her while Jason claims that she she was manipulative to all of these men that she was involved with, including him. Jason also claimed that after the two had broken up, she was the one who was continuously trying to get back together with him. But either way, the two did keep talking after the breakup. But she did end up moving out of the apartment that they shared together and she moved back home to Stanley to live with her mother. At this point, Ezra felt like her whole life was crumbling. She felt like Jason was ripped away from these two men. She really felt like Alex was the one who was responsible for her and Jason's relationship failing. So in February of 2018, she had actually texted Alex to never speak to her again and Alex obeyed this. He did not contact her at all after she had told him not to. At this point, she was doing everything that she possibly could to get back together with Jason. She had sent Jason all of these journals where she wrote about how bad she felt about betraying him, but still, Jason wanted absolutely nothing to do with these and he still refused to see her in person. So at around 10.30 a.m. on March 22nd, 2018, Ezra showed up unannounced to Racy's coffee shop to see Jason. When Jason saw her, he described her as being extremely agitated and acting completely out of the ordinary. She had told Jason that she had planned to go back to Alex's house to return some items to him. These items included a heating pad and a bookmark. She had also told him that she wanted to go ahead and read some of her journal entries to Alex. These journal entries were pretty much talking about how she felt like she had been assaulted, like her voice had been taken away from her and she just wanted to get her voice back. So she left the coffee shop shortly after this with what Jason describes as a rage in her eyes. The way that Ezra was acting was just so strange to Jason that he just had this gut feeling that something was off. He knew that Ezra and Alex hadn't spoken in weeks before that since Ezra had told Alex to stop talking to her. So he just thought that it was really bizarre that all of a sudden she was trying to go back to Alex's house. He followed his intuition and as soon as Ezra left, he took off towards Alex's house on his bike. When he got there, he saw Ezra's 2003 Chevy Impala parked outside with the engine still running, with the driver's side door still open, with music still playing. He just had this pit in his stomach, but he didn't enter the house right away. He was actually seen by a witness pacing back in 
forth in front of the house for around 40 minutes, and then he entered the house without knocking. This witness found this very unsettling, so he went ahead and called police. After Jason went inside, he saw that Ezra and Alex were having a conversation, but he said that when he walked in, their faces were like masks. He said that he could just tell that something was happening, like he could feel the tension, but they were both acting like everything was okay. He told the both of them that something just didn't feel right and told them that they needed to go outside and find a public space to talk. So all of them went outside, but by this point, police had shown up. Police questioned the three of them, and initially, Jason told police that he was worried about Ezra because she just was not acting like herself. He said that he had just gotten the vibe that something just isn't right. So police spoke to Ezra and she told them that everything was fine. She wasn't afraid or threatened by any of these men. And they're in the house on the corner here or? Yeah, they're on the, I think they're fine though. I mean, I don't okay. know. I'm, I'm just- I just saw the door to the car was standing open too. Was yeah, open I wanted to turn her car up. Her car was running. So that's why I was like worried because it was running. And I was like, okay, uh, what's going on? Like what's going on? Is everything okay? Okay. <sighs> just worried. I don't think he's dangerous, but I don't know. Do you know what his name is? Alex, Alex Woodsworth. Okay. Or Wood, Woods, yeah, I think it's Woodsworth or Woodsworth. you mind if I grab my bike quick? Uh, just give me your address here and a phone number, and then we'll let you head out for now. Oh, I'm not going to head out. I'm, I'm just going to... You can head over there. Okay. I'll go and check on them. Okay. You can go over by your bike. Hi. Is everything okay here? Yeah. Okay. Somebody called us kind of worried because they saw Jason come over here and yeah. he was going in the car and they weren't sure what was going on. No. no. Everything's fine. Everything's yeah. fine? Okay. Do you guys have any idea with you? Just yeah. yeah. I got to write a report here that I came over and talked sure. with you guys. They were just a little worried because they saw the car running over here and they weren't sure what was going on yeah. and all that jazz. Sorry for all this, like... It's okay. It's okay. I'd rather come here and check and it be yeah. nothing than have something bad happening. Okay. There Thank you go. You. you guys are good to go. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. We're good to go. Everything's good. They're okay. Everything's fine. I'll take care of it, too. No problem. All right. You have a good day. So by 1.05 p.m., police determined that there was not anything weird or suspicious going on, so they just left. As they're leaving, we can see a shot of Jason speaking to Alex while Ezra's still in the car. Ezra had insisted that the two go out into nature to continue their conversation, so they left to go wherever to finish talking it out. Then, just three hours later, at around 4.15 p.m. that same day, John Sipple, a dairy farmer in Springbrook, had heard a knock on his door. When he opened, he saw Ezra standing there. Her clothes were all tattered and torn. She wasn't wearing any shoes and she was covered in mud, blood, and bruises. She was in complete distress and he said that she didn't even know her own name and she asked him to call the doctor saying that she had just been assaulted. But John Sipple did not call the doctor. Instead, he called police. So when police arrived and asked her about what happened, she pretty much told them that she knew that she felt very afraid of Alex Woodworth but couldn't really remember much about the attack. She, again, couldn't even remember her own name. But when police asked her if she had anybody that they could call, she immediately said Jason Mingle. So she was taken to the hospital and they examined all of her injuries. She had three superficial cuts to her palm and scratches on her forearm. These scratches were done in a way that the word boy was carved into her forearm. She had a couple of scratches on her thigh and a few very shallow scratches on her jaw. And again, her clothes were all torn and tattered and looked as if they had been cut through 
through. Now, of course, seeing a boy carved into a young lady's arm, the hospital staff was very concerned and confused. When they initially asked her how this got carved into her arm, she told them that Alex Woodworth had done that. However, after examining her further, according to the hospital staff, all of these wounds appeared to be self-inflicted. So police immediately started to go out and search for Alex Woodworth, but he was nowhere to be found. Detectives called his house, they called his cell phone, and they asked his family where he was, but nobody was able to locate him. So the next day, the next thing that they thought to do was to search Don Sibyl's farm. As they were driving, they spotted a muddy side road. They stopped and saw footprints coming from the top of the hill down to the road until they had spotted a car that was stuck in the mud. Detectives were standing at the top of the hill and at this point, they couldn't exactly see the car very clearly. So they took out their binoculars and saw that there was a bloody body hanging out of the back of this car. Immediately, police knew that this was Ezra's car and immediately they knew that this body belonged to Alex Woodworth. If as soon as they saw him, they rushed over to his body to help, but nothing more could be done because he was already dead. This scene was absolutely horrific and showed signs of a very violent attack. 24-year-old Alex Woodworth had been stabbed 16 times in his head, neck, groin, and torso. Immediately, police returned to the hospital to confront Ezra with what they had just found. And as soon as she was confronted with this information, her memory returned. She admitted to stabbing Alex, but said that this was in self-defense. She said that the two had began arguing when she was in the driver's seat and Alex was in the passenger seat. She said that as the two were arguing, he had grabbed her forearm, which caused a great bit of anxiety for her, so she kind of started to panic and everything went dark. She said that he started calling her boy and he was getting very angry with this argument So he took the knife and started to carve something into her arm She said that he had carved the word boy into her arm because he knew that she had struggled with her identity in high school She said that he would call her boy all the time and she tried telling him that she just does not identify that way anymore But he refused to use her proper pronouns and continued calling her a boy She said that he pretty much just did this to be mean to her and to demean mean her. started driving again okay and it was just because I remember it happening like being grabbed and just feeling hurt and anxious and then it just starts getting really really dark fuzzy for me just feeling so anxious okay and so how does your arm get cut up um Alex like he grabbed it and then he kept telling me about being a boy and stuff like that how frustrating it is and then he like threatened me. What do you mean he threatened you? He just he didn't say he was gonna do something, but he grabbed me and started doing something. What do you mean he started doing something? He started like carving something into my arm. 
Where is this? On your arm? She said that they continued fighting and struggling with the knife when they ended up in the back seat of her car. She said that Alex continued attacking her by cutting her pants open. She said that he was trying to sexually assault her and she was absolutely terrified and she didn't know what to do. So she grabbed the knife by the blade and just started stabbing him. She said that she was just stabbing anywhere that she could to make him stop attacking her. However, once detectives started investigating the scene, they found that her story just did not make sense. First of all, the way the two were sitting in the car and the way she described the struggle just didn't make any sense for him being able to carve the word boy into her arm so perfectly. If he did it, it would have been upside down and it wouldn't have been so perfect because there would have been a struggle. So using this, they got her to admit that she did carve the word boy into her own arm. After this incident, did you do anything to yourself? Did you harm yourself in any way? No, I didn't want to. You said, but well, what happened? I didn't harm myself. You didn't? No, when I fell, I hurt my hand and I bit my toe. Okay. And then the boy carved in your arm. Okay. The part that throws me off on that is if I'm sitting here and he's going to be carving it in, he, he, it's written perfect with a right hand person like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. If he would write it in, it would have been reversed, right? Mm -hmm. How did boy get put in your arm? He didn't do that to you, did he? You, you carved boy into your own arm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. When did that happen? That happened when I was in the car. In the car with him? Or why? When, when I was in that car after I woke up the second time. So after you stabbed him and you came back into it as you put it because you blacked out, that's when you carved this in? Then, going off of this, Ezra had no deep injuries to support her claim that she grabbed the knife by its jagged blade. All of her wounds were very superficial and were more so just like scratches. Additionally, Ezra said that she had stabbed Alex for the majority of the times inside of the car. However, most of the blood found at the scene was outside of the car. So, they initially thought that he was stabbed outside of the car and then tried to get into the car, possibly to get away from her. Also, Alex had absolutely no defensive wounds on his body. That made them think that Ezra took him completely by surprise and came up behind him when she stabbed him. They think that they were both outside of the car and then when his back was turned, she came up behind him and stabbed him in the head first and then did all the other stabbings in a fit of rage. They believe that this all happened because the two got into an argument and she snapped or she went to his house planning to do all of this. They thought that she was in a state of mind where she believed that she needed to get Alex out of the picture to finally get back together with Jason. So, due to all of this, by April 6, 2018, Ezra was arrested and charged with first-degree intentional homicide. Then her trial started on October 15, 2019 at the Dunn County Judicial Center. So, first, let's describe everything that the defense had to say. So, the defense described a situation where Ezra was a very vulnerable victim of Alex, who was actually a very disturbed individual who was absolutely obsessed with Ezra. The defense described a situation where Alex had a history of pressuring Ezra into doing sexual acts that she didn't actually want to do. The day that she had met up with Alex, she said that she had went there with the intentions of talking to him so that the two could maybe remain friends after all of this. She says that on the day of the murder, the two were just driving around their car aimlessly while talking when the car got stuck in the mud. At that point, the defense claimed that Alex said that he deserved to sleep with Ezra one more time. They said that Alex had Ezra in the car and began attacking her because she declined his sexual advances. The defense said, that she was just absolutely frozen in fear as he took advantage of her. She had cuts in her clothes to support that he was the one who cut them so that he could keep attacking her. Then the defense changed the story of how she actually grabbed the knife from him. Instead of her grabbing it by its jagged blade while he was attacking her, she said that she kneed him in the groin so hard to the point that he actually dropped the knife. Then she instantly picked it up after he dropped it and, out of self-defense, she started 
started stabbing him anywhere that she could. But even as she was stabbing him, the attack continued and she kept having to defend herself until the attack finally stopped. Once the attack finally stopped, they said that Alex was still alive, so he finally got out of the car and was staggering around, dripping blood as he was walking around. They said that Alex was pretty much trying to find a way to get away and that's why he was walking around outside and that's why all the blood was out there. They said that as Alex was staggering around, he asked Ezra for help and she cautiously agreed and went over to try and save his life. But as she was trying to help him, he grabbed her again and continued to attack her. And that is when she made the final blow to the back of his head. After this, she knows that she had just killed her friend and she goes into absolute shock and everything just goes black. And that is when the defense says that she mindlessly carved the word boy into her arm because she just didn't know what was going on anymore. And she just had the situation where he was making her feel horrible, calling her boy. So maybe in that moment, she felt like she needed to scar herself with the word boy. Then after all of this happened, she was able to sort of collect herself enough to run back up the hill where they came from and gets to the farm where she eventually knocked on the door. So that is all pretty much how the defense says this happened. So then, of course, the prosecution came back and outlined the entire timeline of what happened that day up until the murder, as we discussed earlier, with her going to see Jason and and Alex and then all of that happening. And Jason testified about the rage in her eyes that he saw and just how bizarre she was acting the entire day. They also mentioned that when she had spoken to police just hours before the murders, she herself said that she did not feel threatened of neither Jason or Alex whatsoever. After investigators found the location that Alex's body was eventually found at, the prosecution said that the scene just was not a fight or a struggle like Ezra claimed. They said that Ezra had used a knife that she had grabbed from her dad's house a few days before the murder and then went to meet up with Alex with the intention of killing him. And the fact that she had grabbed this knife so many days before the murder shows that she had full intention of killing him. They said that she went over to his house to confront him and argue with him. They said that the two had gotten in the car and drove around to talk and that she brought him to this location where they would be more isolated. They said that the two had gotten out of the car to continue arguing. They said that she then stabbed him in the back of the head as soon as he turned his back to her and then she continued stabbing him over and over again so deep that it pierced his organs. It was a very intentional act. Then, after the murder, she carved the word boy into her own arm because she did feel guilty and because she didn't want to forget what she had just did. She then cut her shirt and her pants in hopes of staging an attack. Then, of course, she ran over to the farm and completely fabricated the story of her not being able to remember anything. Just a little weird that she couldn't remember her own name, she couldn't remember the attack, but magically, she could remember Jason Mangle's name. Then, of course, the prosecution outlined the crime scene about how everything was so inconsistent with what Ezra was saying, about how the blood was mostly on the outside of the car, not the inside, which doesn't make sense if the stabbings had started inside of the car. Even if he was staggering around outside, that doesn't make any sense for why there was almost no blood inside of the car. They also said that she had very minor cuts and scratches, not any deep wounds like you would expect. When they were asked about why Alex would get back into the car after the attack. They basically said it was because he was just trying to get back in the car to get away from Ezra as she was attacking him. They said that the reason he was hanging out of the backseat of the car was because after he had crawled in, she tried to pull him out of the car so that she could drive away, but she wasn't able to, so she just left on foot. They also said that after the attack, Ezra had actually taken Alex's phone with her, threw it on the ground, and smashed it so that he would have have no way to contact anybody for help. They also said that after she was seen and spoke to police, they asked her about where all of this took place. Now, she did say that she couldn't remember where it happened, but she did give a description of a park that was totally different from the one it actually happened in. They said that this was done to intentionally mislead police to delay them finding her car. They argued that by her own words, she didn't feel threatened by Alex, so why would she feel the need to defend herself? Why would she go alone with him in the car if 
if there was this history of him abusing her and pressuring her into sexual favors? Why didn't the scene match up with everything that she was saying? Why didn't she have any wounds? All the wounds were so superficial that this didn't really warrant the amount of violence that she showed back to him. Absolutely none of this made any sense for her argument of self-defense. Of course, Ezra had also taken the stand to share her own story. Throughout the trial though, she did not show any sort of remorse. I personally watched all of the opening statements from both sides. I watched the police and EMT testimony as well as Jason's testimony. I watched her demeanor throughout all of this and to me, it looked like the only time she had any sort of reaction was when they showed the very gruesome pictures of what Alex looked like after the attack. And she didn't even show that she was very sad, she just sort of looked away from it. He looked horrific and she knew that she was the one who inflicted all of those injuries. So she didn't really feel upset about it, but she was just kind of grossed out by it. She was also dressed very feminine, wearing a pink blazer with her hair down and curly. Some reporters had said that she did this on purpose to appear more meek and innocent looking. Maybe the jury would be a little bit softer on her if she just appeared like she was just this small, fragile, little, innocent girl who couldn't really do all these injuries. How could she possibly do this to someone if she's just so soft and innocent? She also wouldn't really make eye contact with anybody throughout the entire thing. But while Jason was talking, it was clear that she was trying to look good for him. She was messing with her hair, taking her glasses on and off when she would look at him. It was obvious to me that she was still just so concerned with having this image of herself for Jason. Others even said that she appeared to be enjoying certain parts of the trial. One friend said that when they asked her for her name, she excitedly said that her name was Ezra and she spelled it out for everybody, making it clear that she was very happy to be expressing herself and make her true identity be known. Jason said that she even appeared to enjoy talking about what happened to Alex. He said that there was just no fear in her eyes. Her whole demeanor was just so off, and it honestly freaked everybody out. So after listening to all of the testimony and evidence, the jury finally went into deliberation. They only deliberated for three hours before they reached their verdict. They found Ezra McCandless guilty of first degree intentional homicide. After Ezra heard the verdict, Jason said, quote, when she heard the verdict, I think she almost didn't believe it herself. She looked like she was gonna faint, almost. There was like actual fear. No one believes me anymore, I'm caught. And this was the only time that she actually showed emotion. We, the jury, find the defendant, Ezra J. McCandless, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide as charged in the information. And the answer to the special verdict question is yes. Use the dangerous weapon. Again, you may be seated. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, is this your verdict? All right, I'm going to do what's called polling the jury and I'm going to ask each of you if this is your verdict. One juror commented on the verdict and said that the thing that really landed their decision was the fact that she stabbed Alex in the head first. That is an intentional act to kill someone. They also noticed how emotionless she was. They said that they expected Ezra to show some emotion, some remorse, but there was absolutely none of that. But by her sentencing hearing, apparently she did show some remorse and she directly apologized to Alex's family. She said, quote, I want to say how sorry I am that they have lost their son, but sorry doesn't cut it in my mind. I loved Alex very much and I also feel a great loss. I am so sorry. And Alex's family, most of all. Alex's parents. I want to say how sorry I am that they have lost their son. But sorry doesn't cut it in my mind. That word is not enough and never will be enough for this loss. And I recognize that. I don't think I could ever find words that will be enough to express this, especially to them. The pain they feel is unimaginable. I want to express how sorry I am for this loss because it is such a great loss. I recognize and completely acknowledge this pain and I'm so sorry. I loved Alex very much. 
and I also feel a great loss. And I'm so sorry. And thank you for letting me say this. Thank you. But despite this, Judge James Peterson said that he did not feel that her apology was genuine, so he went through and sentenced her to life in prison. She must serve a minimum of 50 years before she will be eligible for parole. As for Alex's family, I am disgusted with how they portrayed Alex in the trial. It's horrific, and it honestly was very uncomfortable for me to watch just how they portrayed him. It made me really feel for his family because I can't even imagine having to sit there and listen to someone who didn't even know him try to make the argument that he was this sick, twisted sadist who strangled women and raped Ezra. Of course, his family was so upset with this portrayal, and it's just sickening and I do truly feel so bad for his family. At the end of the day, pretty much everybody involved strongly believes that Jason was Ezra's motive for this. That she wanted him so badly that she was doing whatever it takes to get there, even if it meant murdering someone who was supposed to be one of her best friends. And of course, Jason feels absolutely horrible about all of this too. He said, quote, Maybe I missed something. It like slipped through my hands. I still think about both of them though. I think about them both so often. It didn't have to end this way. You didn't have to hurt all of these people. There have been so many people hurt by Ezra's actions and it's just so despicable. She wanted to make herself out to be the victim from the very beginning. I think anybody who lies about someone sexually assaulting them is just so low and it just breaks my heart because it's just such a huge slap in the face to every real victim who actually had to live through that. I think it's obvious that she was struggling. I mean, she had it pretty hard from the very beginning, but that is absolutely no excuse for what happened. It's just truly tragic and unbelievable, but at the end of the day, I'm just glad that Alex got the justice that he deserves. So that is pretty much where the case ends. This case was one that literally just sucked me in. When I tell you I watched at least 10 hours of that trial, I am not exaggerating. I watched whatever footage I could get my hands on and I'm really glad that I was able to watch so much of it because I got the opportunity to just sit there and watch Ezra's body language and facial expressions as she sat through the trial. And I think it gave me a very good perspective as to what I think truly happened in this case in order for me to give you guys the absolute absolute best account of this trial that I possibly could. But this case still is up to some debate, so I really want to hear what you guys think. Do you think that this was planned by Ezra? Do you think that this was a spur of the moment type of thing? Or do you think that this really was in self-defense? Please leave your thoughts and theories in the comments below, but either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn on the notifications to be notified of any future videos that I make. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below and if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye! <laughs>